Uh, good evening, uh, everybody. Um, it's a great privilege uh, for me to have as my guest this evening, uh, David Strathnor. Uh, David Strathnor is a practicing uh, immigration attorney from LA. Um, he's been in the business for well over 16 years, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, uh, David. Yeah, that's right. Both in government and as a private attorney. So on both sides of the window, you can say. Yeah. And I mean, David, I see you and your family uh, were from the Ukraine and immigrated to the United States. So you're, you're very familiar with uh, the nightmares and the obstacles involved in immigration. Hopefully it wasn't as cumbersome as it is nowadays uh, when you moved as a young family. Yeah, I mean, uh, things were probably simpler then. Uh, you know, we actually moved as refugees um, okay. from the Soviet Union uh, back in the 70s. So it was definitely a different time, a different process. Uh, but, you know, immigration is near and dear to my heart because it's a, it's a personal experience for me as well. And, you know, I'm very Absolutely. happy to, to yeah. be helping. And then, David, the yeah, sure. Yes. David, and then, I mean, a little bit of further about your background. I mean, you're a member of the uh, Immigration Lawyers Association. Um, you also sit on various student advisory boards um, and you qualified from the University of California, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. That is right. But more importantly for me is that you had quite a long history in the diplomatic corps um, where you established like really good relationships uh, and great, got a greater understanding of what actually happens at the consulate aspect. Um, and I certainly know in our experience uh, engaging with you um, where we've had some sensitivities, you've got great insight. Do you want to maybe just tell us a little bit about your experience in terms of the um, diplomatic aspect um, where you served in several several countries? Sure, absolutely. So um, prior to my returning to private practice um, about five, six years ago, I worked for the US Department of State for 10 years uh, as a consular officer and, and some other positions as well. So I'm sort of intimately involved uh, or have intimate experience of the visa process from the inside. Um, so I understand sort of the terrain. Um, a lot of times when clients, applicants, petitioners have problems uh, with the, the visa process, uh, especially when you get to US consular posts abroad, it's all just a black box. Nobody really knows what's going on, why decisions are made. Uh, yep. You know, the Department of State does a very good job of keeping that information from people. Uh, and yep. so you know, and, and you and I, Stuart, we, we've worked together for a while now. Uh, you, you know that there's been certain cases where, you know, clients or, or applicants have run into those situations. And I'd say there's two aspects to what I do. Um, one is, yeah, I do still have close ties to people inside of the diplomatic service and consular services, which helps at least establish a line of communication. Uh, but even more importantly, I think, is the inside knowledge of just how it works and sort of yep. what, where, where to push, where not to push, what can be done, what can't be done. And in a situation where something can be done, uh, you know, I have a pretty good idea of, of how to do it, of how to get yep. from no, A to B without no, sure. ruffling feathers, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, we, we've certainly had a, a, a couple of interesting cases. And I mean, you've always come to my rescue. In fact, in one or two cases, I've moved files from uh, other filing attorneys across to you just because I knew you had the skill to be able to uh, make sure that it popped out on the other side. But uh, yeah, David, we're now going to, we're now, now going to move on to uh, my sort of core focus. So um, as many of the people that are watching this uh, podcast are aware, um, I focus specifically on the EB-5 program and have been active in the, in the environment since 2008. So certainly a, a bit of a, a veteran possibly a war veteran in respect of EB-5 and processing and uh, uh, such like. But it's been a really terrific experience. And we certainly helped a lot of South Africans uh, uh, take the journey. Um, we have had a 100% success rate, largely due to us surrounding ourselves with uh, um, the correct uh, immigration council who makes such a core focus of um, this process if one elects to go through the EB-5. But David, would you mind giving us an unbiased uh, opinion just in respect of how the EB-5 investor visa program differs from a lot of these other visa categories. Um, and what really makes the EB-5 maybe um, a preferred methodology for those that can 
to decide to go down EB5 opposed to other visa categories that may or may not be available to yeah. South Africans? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, I mean, I think it, it requires a little bit of background, uh, a short background about the U.S. immigration process and the different ways that people can immigrate or get non-immigrant visas. Uh, it really falls into a number of different buckets. One is family-based immigration. Uh, another is employment-based immigration, where you actually have an employer that wants to sponsor you. Uh, and then there's sort of the humanitarian bucket, uh, where things like asylum, uh, things like that. So another category, and this is where EB-5 falls into it, is uh, the investment category. So there's, there are a number of ways that uh, a person can come to the United States, either as a non-immigrant or as an immigrant, through investment in the United States. And there are a couple of main requirements uh, in EB-5, and those are essentially that you and I'll, I'll sort of simplify it at this point, but uh, you have to make an investment, sustain an investment, and the investment has to create jobs, essentially. Um, and I'd say that the benefits to this uh, process, especially EB-5 and going straight for the green card if you have the means, uh, and we can get into those requirements too, uh, but the me you know, having the, the means to actually do it is important. But if you do have that, uh, the process is really a lot simpler um, than other, uh, the other paths that we talked about. So, for example, you know, it, it differs from employment in that employment-based immigration, you're tied to your employer, at least initially, uh, prior to, to getting the green card. And, you know, maybe you have to go through the non-immigrant process as well. And it, it, it's just a lot more complicated where, um, although... I wouldn't say that EB-5 is 100% is foolproof or an easy process. Uh, it's more of a streamlined process and it's more of a clear process. We know generally what needs to be done, what needs to be proven, uh, and, and that really gives you a benefit. Another benefit, I think, of the green card process through EB-5 is basically, you know, it's not just you. It's uh, if, you, if you apply and are successful uh, with your petition, then uh, your spouse gets a green card, uh, children under 21 and possibly slightly over 21, we'll get to that soon I think, uh, can also get a green card and move to the, United, uh, to the United States. It's also, I'd say, going the green card route directly is beneficial for a lot of reasons uh, uh, versus the non-immigrant uh, path uh, because with a green card, you basically just do it once. Um, it's not something, although we will talk a little bit about sort of the, the two-step process for EB-5, but once you go through the process, get a green card, then you have it. Now you have uh, almost all of the rights of a U.S. citizen aside from being able to vote, uh, essentially. Uh, whereas if you go a non-immigrant visa route, uh, say an L visa or even an E visa, things like that, those are things you have to renew over and over and over again. And the immigrant... <coughs> excuse me, the immigration service continues to get an additional bite of the apple, basically, uh, to, to re-adjudicate your case. Uh, so that's something that doesn't occur with EB-5 and the green card process, which I'd say is a big yeah. thing. And I mean, David, um, you, you can vouch. I mean, um, unfortunately, adjudication on a lot of those other visa categories um, is very, very inconsistent. Yeah. Um, and specifically where you've got a family unit that, um, where the aspiration right up front was to you know, physically pack up, relocate, reestablish. Um, going through other visa categories can be quite quite a cumbersome process um, and certainly um, quite stressful um, for family units. Absolutely. And I would just add that with the non-immigrant visa processes, even if you're successful, if you are, if one of your goals at least is to bring your, your child along as well, uh, that's only possible up through... Uh, 21, basically, once they reach adulthood, which the U.S. immigration considers 21 years of age, uh, if you're going through a non-immigrant process, the, the child now drops off, essentially, of your renewals, whereas with the green card, if you can get that child in before they're 21, or possibly slightly uh, older than 21 in certain circumstances, uh, then they're good to go going forward. They don't have yeah. to do anything else. 
David, just explain the age out uh, scenario because we do have a lot of our uh, investor base that um, are very concerned that we are filing uh, just before the child turns 21. And there's a little bit of a calculation methodology behind it. If you wouldn't mind just going into this age out scenario um, into a little bit more detail. Absolutely. So age outs are a very important aspect to EB-5, absolutely. And generally the idea is that uh, if a child, uh, a dependent child is under 21, then they can immigrate with the petitioner. If that child is over 21, they no longer qualify as a dependent. However, uh, there's some, there was a law passed uh, in the United States probably 20 years ago called the Child Status Protection Act, uh, CISPA, we call it for short, our little acronym, uh, which basically says that, uh, or, or pro basically provides protections for children over 21 if certain things happen prior to them being 21. Uh, and specifically, uh, and it gets a little complicated, but I'll talk specifically about South Africans right now. Um, specifically, if you file your uh, initial EB-5 petition, which is called the I-526 petition, uh, prior to the child turning 21, and then if the uh, petition is approved, then under CISPA, the time that was spent, that USCIS spent uh, adjudicating the petition doesn't count towards the child's age. So for example, let's say, um, you, you file the case um, when the child is you know, three months away from, from 21 years of age. It takes 18 months to adjudicate the petition. Now the child is 22 years old. They're no longer 20. However, for purposes of CISPA, because it took 18 months uh, to adjudicate the case, they'll subtract those 18 months from the child's age. Uh, and so now the child under you know, what we call their CISPA age is now back to under 21. And once the petition is approved, if the child's CISPA age is still under 21 uh, and the petitioner uh, within one year seeks to apply for an immigrant visa or, try, or seeks to adjust status if they're in the United States, uh, then that CISPA age will be uh, locked in, essentially. So it doesn't, once you essentially try to apply for a visa, so pay for a visa uh, application fee, or submit some documents, uh, that age gets locked in. And so it's locked in until the adjudication of the visa. One big uh, caveat to that, and this is where it gets a little bit more complicated, is this is only true as long as uh, the visa category, so EB-5 specifically, is not backlogged, meaning that uh, the nationality in question uh, does not have to wait in a line for a visa after the petition is approved. And there's a number of nationalities that do have to do that with, for example, Chinese nationals or Vietnamese nationals or possibly Indian nationals in the future. Right now, I believe it's current. Luckily uh, for everybody else, including South Africans, that's not the case. They're not standing in a line uh, to get a visa after their petition is approved. And so for them, CISPA would be completely uh, valid and in place and give protection to, to dependent children. That's great, uh, David. Uh, that's, that's a really good explanation. Um, often it's um, something that we have to go into detail with a lot of our potential uh, investors. Um, what is interesting, on... I, I will just say one thing, because yes. going back to our conversation about uh, you know, difficulty with consulates uh, and sort of where I've gotten involved with, with some cases and we've worked together in the past, as you know, is it's, it's the CISPA issue, exactly, which is Correct. so confusing it's confusing to some attorneys and it's confusing, frankly, to a lot of consular officers at diplomatic yep. posts. And they constantly, and unfortunately, this is something that happens in South Africa at the consular post, yep. um, where they just get confused about CISPA and they'll tell you that, no, this child does not qualify for uh, a visa as a dependent because they've aged out when clearly they haven't and they just don't understand yep. the rules. And so, you know, it, Part of what I do as well is just, you know, because I have good offices with a lot of consular posts is 
is I'm able to just explain things to them and, and uh, sure. communicate things to them in order to sort of resolve these tricky issues. And it's not really their fault. I mean, they're all very smart people. It's just these are really complicated issues and they're not lawyers by training. They don't even know all of the rules all the no, time. Sure. David, um, and then following on from visa availability, um, I mean, we're, we're, we're very fortunate in South Africa that we do have visa availability. Um, and does that, does that help in any way from an adjudication aspect? Does it speed up uh, an EB-5 process? I mean, is there priority given to countries like South Africa? Um, I know that there was some um, news that broke um, a couple of months ago where they would give priority um, in terms of adjudications to countries that had visa availability? Yeah, I mean, this has actually been great progress on the part of USCIS. Uh, historically, that has not been the case. Uh, historically, all adjudications have basically been uh, just first in gets adjudicated regardless of nationality and regardless of whether, you know, even if the case gets adjudicated, you have to wait 15 years for a visa, like Ch Chinese nationals, or maybe 10 years for a visa. Uh, USCIS has streamlined somewhat, and now their current uh, policy and position is that uh, there's basically a two-tier adjudication system uh, where countries like uh, for Chinese nationals or Vietnamese nationals, where there is a significant backlog, China, China mostly, uh, those cases will essentially be held. Uh, they're not going to give priority adjudication. And they will instead give priority adjudication to countries where there is no backlog. And so when you look at the normal processing time uh, for USCIS on their website, you'll see something just crazy and outrageous, like, you know, 36 to 48 months processing time for an I-526 petition. But the thing to understand is that that's an average processing time, uh, including everybody, whether you're backlogged or not backlogged, uh, where with this new policy, what we're seeing is that non-backlog countries are actually being adjudicated a lot faster uh, than backlog countries. And so that's a great benefit to South African nationals because, you know, instead of waiting the 36 to 48 months, which is the average, uh, although we can't pinpoint an exact processing time, you know, it's probably more in the ballpark of between 12 and 24 months, maybe even less depending on the project you pick. Correct. Uh, yeah, David, I mean, um, certainly we, we um, monitor our adjudications. We've recently had a batch that came through in 30 months, which was most probably record time in terms of current circumstances, but typically around the 20 months in terms of what we uh, mentioned to our, our investors as an expectation. Yeah. Um, David, in terms of COVID, um, we obviously assume that there have been some slowdowns. Uh, thankfully, the, the furloughs um, issue seems to have been addressed. Do you see um, immigration timelines, adjudication specifically on the EB-5 investment visa improving? Um, um, I'd say it's a two-part question. You have to look at uh, both the, the domestic USCIS side for the adjudication of petitions. Um, I think that that's less... Um, dependent on COVID. I know a lot of USCIS employees during the quarantine were working from home and that just naturally slows down things, but I, I don't think yep. it was a significant slowdown. Um, you know, one good thing, the furloughs with USCIS, USCIS never happened. Uh, Congress just passed a law uh, that basically through increased premium processing fees, although EB-5 doesn't get premium processing, but through those fees, uh, it seems like that's going to at least secure the finances of USCIS so that they don't have to furlough people in the future. And hopefully, you know, at least the, the adjudication processing times will stay the same. Uh, that would be my hope. And if they improve, then that, that would be even, even better. Um, I think the biggest issue and the, the greatest consequences uh, for COVID are, or, or relating to COVID are after um, adjudication. So you get the approval and now you have to apply for the visa. And so the problem is that when COVID happened, all of these consular posts and in South Africa is no exception, you know, they just sent people home, uh, you know, people that, and so all of the consular posts were working on skeletal staff, uh, skeletal staffing. Uh, they just, you know, suspended all normal visa processing. 
uh, you know, hopefully now that things uh, seem to be turning a corner a little bit into 2021, uh, people will be coming back, the staffing will increase, and, and they'll adjudicate again. Uh, but, you know, I can't, I have to, I have to be honest that, of course, COVID is making it, making it a lot more difficult uh, to get a, an appointment, essentially. Once you get an appointment, the visa isn't, you know, it's not a huge issue, but, uh, you know, just being able to get an appointment, getting NVC to uh, move your case forward to the visa stage, uh, COVID definitely is affecting that. Yep. Um, David, I wanted you just to elaborate a little bit um, on the re-entry uh, visa uh, or re-entry uh, waiver. Um, a lot of our South Africans will activate a green card, but um, may need to remain in South Africa to maintain business uh, affairs going. Do you want to just explain the methodology of making application for a re-entry permit um, sure. to those that would, would like a further clarification on exactly what it is and what its benefits are in terms of the maintenance of a green card post uh, your first arrival. Absolutely. So one of the key things, once you get a green card, uh, you become a lawful permanent resident of the United States. And that has certain requirements if you want to keep that lawful permanent residence. Uh, and that's what's known as maintenance of status. And so through maintenance of status, you basically have to show that you have sufficient ties to the United States and that you maintain those ties uh, to meet the requirements of keeping the green card. So there's a number of ways to do that. Uh, for people who you know, initially don't want to move to the United States, uh, but aren't planning on, on being absent for you know, more than a year or two, uh, maybe just you know, six months at a time, there are things you can do. You, you don't need a re-entry permit at that point. Uh, as long as you come to the United States at least every six months for a visit uh, and are maintaining status in other ways, such as uh, make sure you're paying your taxes uh, because there, there are tax obligations once, once you become a lawful permanent resident of the United States. Uh, and then there are other things. You have a driver's license. You have a house. Do you have, you know, these sorts of things. They want to know that you have some connection to the United States. Now, if you're not able to do that, and with COVID, travel is a lot more uh, complicated these days. So, so many people can't do that. Although there are, there's a lot more leeway that CBP is giving or Customs and Border Protection uh, is giving to people relating to maintenance of status because of COVID. Uh, that one, notwithstanding, if someone just you know, it wants to get the green card but is not able to maintain their ties initially, or maybe at some point they need to go back, there is something called a re-entry permit um, that you can apply for. And it basically gives you automatic maintenance of status, let's call it, uh, for a period of two years. And you don't have to uh, maintain, so you, now you don't have to come in every six months you have this, uh, this little book, which is a re-entry permit. It looks like a little passport. Uh, and you can use that to come in and out for a period of two years. And they won't question you about your maintenance of status. It basically gives you the automatic maintenance of status for, for a period of two years. Um, the issue, though, is you can't apply for it unless you're in the United States. So it can't be a situation where you get the green card, you come in, you leave, and you want to apply for a re-entry permit once you're back in South Africa. No. Once you immigrate, uh, if you have plans for leaving for quite a while and you think you'll need the re-entry permit, you need to at least be in the United States while you're applying for it. Uh, yeah. It could be just a couple of days even, uh, because sure. USCIS will keep records of that. And as long as you do that, then you know, it's not really that huge of an issue uh, to get a re-entry permit. They usually issue them pretty freely. Yeah, I mean, David, like yourself, I mean, we continuously recheck with investors as they go through um, the various steps. And mm -hmm. typically, um, once they are approved and making that first entry, that's normally where we address and say, let's understand what the family's objectives are in right. terms of this first entry. You know, are half of you staying um, and going to set up home and enroll kids into schools? Um, or is it that you're just simply going across to activate and going to remain here in South Africa for a period of time? while you wrap up uh, business affairs. So um, and it's very thank important. You. 
It's very yep. important to, to keep those ties and to understand what people are doing and to sort of stay ahead of it uh, because you don't want people to like make an entry and they haven't been in the United States for, for you know, nine months or a year and a half or, or something yep. like that because there are actually things that you can do to, to make that entry more simple uh, or, or to make it more streamlined. You know, there are ways sometimes at, at certain airports, LAX where we are is one of them, where if it is a complicated entry relating to maintenance of status, you can actually submit uh, the, the situation, the case for sort of a pre-adjudication uh, with the leadership at, at LAX. It's, it's just a service that, that they provide to, to the lawyers that they're close to. Uh, and, and it's great. I mean, we've used it a lot and it, it sort of eliminates the risk and the stress of flying to the United States when you don't know if they're going to let you in or not. Yeah. Thanks, David. And then p perhaps the, the last question, I mean, most of uh, our viewers will be aware of it, but what are the requirements to be naturalized um, in, a, in a nutshell? Um, the earliest one can do it. And what would one have to demonstrate uh, to be eligible for naturalization? Yeah, basically for, for naturalization, the main requirement is that you have to be a lawful permanent resident for five years uh, for EB-5 uh, situation. For, for spousal, it's a little bit different, but let's just stick to, to EB-5. Uh, and you have to have been physically present in the United States uh, for a significant amount of time. So that's when you get into the situation that we've been talking about before. So if you got your green card, you have it for five years, but you've been in South Africa most of that time, um, you, you, know, you might not be able to naturalize at the moment that you want to naturalize. So you know, it's, it's inherent to, uh, or important to be in the United States as much as possible without any um, you know, long periods that can uh, sort of cut off the, 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 the time period that, that uh, counts towards your naturalization. Uh, and that's, you know, it's a lot of it is a case by case situation. We have to sort of look at each, each client separately, but sort of to keep it simple, it's, it's five years and be in the United States for a significant amount of time. And then of course, when you take the naturalization test, there are other sort of uh, cursory requirements. Like you have to take a test about American politics and government and civics and things like that. Oh, and that's English interesting. Language. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a real thing. Uh, you, you have to study. Uh, even my my parents, when they naturalized back in the 80s, uh, they had to take the test. And I remember, uh, you know, as a seven, eight year old kid, um, helping them study for the test. Yeah. <laughs> it was things that I was learning in school, like, you know, who's the first president and, and the form of government in the United States. So uh, it's still there. It's still something you have to do. Uh, but naturalization tends to be relatively straightforward, uh, especially if you've, you know, been in the United States. Sure. And I mean, just to clarify, I mean, there's no urgency to be naturalized, you know, from the day that you make that very first entry, uh, you're deemed to be a permanent resident. Um, so, you know, you don't have to physically be naturalized at the end of uh, five no, years. No, 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 no. Um, There's people that, yeah. that, that stay on green cards for a long period of time, for whatever Correct. reason, they don't want to naturalize and that's totally fine too. Okay. And then final question, uh, we have the elections coming up. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I'm not across the. I, I got stuck here in March on my on my return, but jeepers, it must be uh, quite an interesting uh, um, roll up to to the final day. What it's happens post elections? <laughs> it's definitely surreal following the election in the United States. Um, you know, uh, I mean, I'm not a political pundit, but. Um, I think the writing is on the wall on what happens next yeah. with the election. I mean, it, it depends on who wins. I mean, if, if the, the current president wins a second term, then I think you, you could expect more of the same, which is uh, restriction on immigration here in the United States. I mean, this, yep. this administration is not shy uh, and is not making a secret that, you know, they wish to restrict immigration uh, in all yep. form. Uh, EB-5, I will say has uh, been spared for the most part. There haven't been, aside from you know, the, the, uh, the new regulations, which you know, are a little bit problematic, but uh, you know, they're not cutting it off. There's no travel bans for, for EB-5, sure. uh, which is the tool that, that this administration loves to use. Um, so if he wins, then I, I'd say so, so more of the same and probably worse, um, yep. probably even more restriction. Uh, 
if he if Biden wins, uh, you know, the good thing about it is that you know there will be probably a reversal with with the restrictionist policies, and it'll be quite quick, I would imagine, because yep. you know the good thing about it is that everything that the administration, the current administration, has done has not been an act of law. There has been no, uh, for the most part, uh, in terms of these restrictions, uh, there's been no act of law passed on by Congress that the president has signed relating to uh, immigration restriction. This has all been done by either executive order um, or by regulation, which is all an administrative process, which means that it can be quickly rolled back. So for example, yeah. Biden wins, on January 20th, on day one, literally right after the election, because this happens every time there's a change in power, um, pretty much I'd say all of the executive orders will be repealed at the stroke of a pen yeah. uh, by, by a new president. Uh, and the regulations will probably take a little bit longer. It'll probably take you know six months to roll back regulations yep. that they wanna roll back. Uh, but I'd say within a year, uh, it, it would happen with a new administration. Now, changing the culture of the, the immigration agencies, that's a little bit different. Uh, yep. It takes a little bit more time. Uh, but, you know, I, I would expect a rollback with, with the President Biden. Yeah. I, 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 I log into those Senate committee, Senate com committee hearings quite often. Um, and it's, it's, it floors me uh, when I see the submissions that come from the USCIS to various senators who are um, don't actually understand what is being presented to them, but it is what it is. It, it is, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Anyway, David, I think that's, that, that's been a great chat. I, I really appreciate your time. Um, and, uh, you know, we're going to have this video now um, publicized on our various blogs. Um, and we're also going to have your contact details for those South Africans that want to reach out directly for, for additional gardens. But uh, that was great. I really appreciate your time. I think we covered a number of um, um, items that are, would be of interest to our investor base. So once again, thanks very much. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and thank you for having me. And, uh, you know, we'll see what happens with this election going forward and hope, we'll hope yep. for the best on, on immigration. And, uh, you know, I look forward to speaking with you again next time. Perfect. Thanks very much, David. Take All care. Right. Okay, bye-bye.